We are going to turn to the book of Psalms. If you turn with me to Psalm chapter 13. Last Sunday we looked at Psalm chapter 3. We read one of David's prayers. We're skipping over the next 10 Psalms and we're going to focus on different Psalms throughout the book. Psalm chapter 13. We're going to read it together and then we'll see what it has to say to us. I've been bringing up a few things about the Psalms and I want to remind you that Psalms are prayers of covenant relationship. The people who wrote the Psalms, whether it was David or someone else, they wrote it already in a relationship with God, already standing with Him. So they're not writing out of a place of, is He going to hear me or not, or am I on good terms with God? This is someone who already has met with God and put their faith in God, who writes this prayer. So let's read Psalm 13. It says, to the choir master. A Psalm of David. <clears throat> How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Verse 3. <laughs> Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Heavenly Father, as we approach Psalm 13, I ask that you would speak to us, and that you would help us to see what you want us to hear from this psalm. Amen. As we walk through this psalm, it's a prayer. And I see it comes in three parts. If you have a Bible open with you, then you can look with me, and you'll see verse 1 and 2 is kind of a section together. And we're going to call it David's Despair. David's Despair. The second part is the next two verses, verses 3 and 4. It's David's prayer. The whole thing is a prayer, but those two verses are an ask. Please give me this. First part is David's despair and David's prayer. And the third part is David's trust. That's verses 5 and 6, but I have trusted. So let's look at those parts. This prayer opens with these words, How long, O Lord? A short little question, and initially, if you read only that sentence, you wouldn't know what he's talking about. He says, How long? How long what? He spells it out in his next questions. And when you read them, they're not comfortable questions. They're not feel good, sing an upbeat song kind of questions. They're hard questions. Will you forget me forever? Who is he talking to? <coughs> He's talking to God. Who will say to God, will you forget me? Does God forget anything? No. He knows all things and has a perfect memory. In fact, he knows the future. So how can David pray, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? There in verse 1. Hide your face from me. I believe that David prayed this out of pain and sadness. And it comes from a pain and sadness in his 
earthly circumstance, but also in his relationship with his heavenly Father. Because like I have said numerous Sundays, their prayers of relationship, David already knows that he's on the right page with God. He already knows I'm a part of God's people. He already knows God has anointed him king over Israel. He has God's favor. And so when he prays, will you forget me forever? It's not a theological statement about God that God's memory has failed. It's a prayer of inner anxiety. It's a prayer that says, probably, well, I know you forget nothing, God, but I feel forgotten. The way my circumstances are playing out right now, it feels like you've looked somewhere else. Like you're my father, but you're not looking at me. And, and things are happening to me, and it feels like you don't know about it. I think if you had pushed David, in the middle of writing this psalm, however many thousands of years ago that was, and said, do you think that God has the ability to forget? He would say, no. Like, I think if you really push it and said, what were you implying in that psalm? I don't think he would have said, God's memory failed. But out of an experience of life, he says, in this pit, it feels like God has forgotten me. This is a, a figure of speech when it says, How long will you hide your face from me? The Old Testament and the Hebrew mind thinks that seeing someone's face is a sign of favor and attention. And not seeing their face is a sign of disfavor. For example, we had looked briefly last time I preached about Absalom. And Absalom was estranged from his father and then was brought back to the kingdom, but then lived in his own house. And at some point, it says something to the effect of, I can't even see my father's face. There's that idea, if I could see his face, if he would let me see his face, I know that I'm in his good books, so to speak. And there's a familiar blessing in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 24, that it, within that blessing it says, may God make His face to shine upon you. As if that's a, a top tier blessing. You know, we're going to pray that God would make His face shine upon you. Well, what does that mean? That He would show you His favor, as if He's looking down from heaven and the sun is shining upon you. Like it's a metaphor of blessing. So when David would pray, how long will you hide your face from me? It's the opposite. He's saying, I don't, I don't feel that blessing. I don't, I don't feel any of let God shine his face upon you. It feels dark where I am. When we looked at Psalm 3, it said at the very top of the psalm, it says when he fled from his son Absalom. So it gave us some of the context, you know what was going on when he read this. But this psalm does not. It says, to the choir master, a psalm of David. And that's part of the beauty of the psalms. They come out of a circumstance, a moment, a particular time, a particular person, David or Solomon or Moses or a son of Asaph. But God inspired the writer and it becomes something that's universal. Something that we could pray in a different circumstance that has the same kind of trouble or the same kind of problem. So we can't dig the same way as we did with Psalm 3 into Psalm 13 and say, well, what was going on in David's life? You could guess. You could read his story. But there's something more general about this one. And you'll notice at the top it says, to the choir master, as many of the Psalms do. We're uh, prone to kind of breeze over it and say, okay, to the choir master. But it's in the Bible. To the choir master. Does it light up your spirit with joy to read to the choir master? It doesn't give me any sort of, you know, revelation the moment I read to the choir master. But just think with me for a moment. What did that mean? That meant that... David wrote it and said, I want the person who leads the choir to have this song. 
That means the person who leads the choir is going to take the psalm and give it to the people who are singing in the choir. That means the people who are singing in the choir are going to sing the psalm, and probably not in a room by themselves, but probably for everybody who would have come through the temple, because that's where the choir would have been. So to the choir master means for the people of God to sing and to hear again and again and again. To the choir master. That means we can take it and hear it in a different circumstance than David and say, no, I, I have a hollow in my life. I've got a family member I'm praying for. And I say, how long? It, it feels like you've hidden your face from this family member of mine. I know you don't forget God, but it, it feels like you've forgotten. I know you hear every prayer, but it feels like you didn't hear this one yet. And He's a great and mighty God. He can hear that prayer. And it, it doesn't insult His majesty. It doesn't break the relationship for you to say, God, this is what it feels like. Four times David says, how long? Like waves upon a beach. Is your pain or your sorrow ever like that? It seems to come around in circles for me when something bothers me. It comes again and you say, all right, all right, we'll just put it down for me. And it just seems to wash over you again. You say, okay, I think that's enough crying for now. It washes over you again. How long must I take counsel in my soul? I think David means you think about it. Take counsel in my soul. It's kind of an odd phrase. We might not say that. But I think he means in my own heart I'm thinking, what am I going to do about this? What is God going to do about this? What do I think about this? What does so and so think about it? And you're going around and around. I'm taking counsel in my soul and having sorrow in my heart all the day. Whatever it was, it was something that bothered David deeply. His last how long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And David had enemies. Saul ended up being his enemy, though he should have been the predecessor king to pass on the crown. He ended up a bitter enemy, chasing David in the wilderness. David's hiding in caves Saul's living in a palace. <clears throat> Saul is listening to people who are ratting David out, and there's rumors spreading about who David is and some secret evil he's done, and it's not true. David's out in the desert somewhere until he's been pushed into the territory of the Philistines. And he's living among the Philistines, and he's starting to partner with them as if that, those are his closer friends than the king of Israel, whose people he's a part of. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? I wonder if he thought about Saul. Saul was his enemy and Saul was rich. Saul had an army. Saul had a throne. David had a cave. David had the desert. It says a band of people gathered around David. People who had like fallen out with the law. It wasn't like a valiant, royal, military group that surrounded him. Like they were a ragtag, like, not sure where you stand, maybe you should be in jail kind of people. And that's who's following David in the desert. His enemy was exalted over him. And he's asking God, how did we end up here? From the day that Samuel anointed me king, I thought, life has taken an incredible up. And now I'm in the dirt. My enemy's over my head. No, he, that, that's David's despair. Look, he's on the edge of saying, I don't know if God's going to answer this prayer. I don't, I don't know where I'm at with God. But we come to his prayer in verse 3. He says, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. His is request is very simple. Please answer me. Please deliver me from my enemy. He says, lest I sleep the sleep of death. So he's worried about dying. Whatever his situation is. Notice though, verse 1 
It says, how long, O oh Lord? That's a good way to address God. Verse 3, O oh Lord, my God. Now it's my God. This is a little bit of a shift. As we move along in this prayer, David's actually processing a little bit. And I think we'll see that more and more. But he says, my God. In the midst of how long, how long are you forgetting me? My God. It's still David's God. In the midst of the trouble. Light up my eyes. Again, kind of a Hebrew figure of speech that means like, if your eyes are half shut, your head is down, it looks like your eyes are dark. But if they be open, you're encouraged, ready to do the next thing. Light up my eyes with what you will do, is his request. Not a meaningless encouragement, not just words, but answer me so that I would say, ah, I see how God is answering me. Now he has three lests. Well, in my translation, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say this, lest my foes rejoice. He doesn't want his enemy to win. And I think it's not just about David and his enemy. But David knows that he's with God. So I think when we read David saying, I, I really wouldn't like my enemy to say, I win. It's not just a matter of I win, you win, who, who's the loser here. David knows that he's with God and he's praying to God. So wrapped up in David's salvation is God's glory. If David, in God's camp, prays to his God, and God does not answer, David could say, you're, what will your enemies say? When I've been praying to you this whole time and trying to walk in your ways, and they'll look and say, obviously David got grounded to the dirt, and his God didn't save him. What does that say about David's God? So he lifts it up and say, my enemies are going to say, I lost. And what does that mean about you and, and me? It's not a, like I say, a big, thick, theological book. This is the nature of God in prayer. That's what he felt. That's what came out in the moment. Saying, what's going to happen? But would you consider and answer me? We can pray the same kind of prayer, can't we? With anything anything that burdened you last week or that's going to burden you this week. I, uh, I have bad news for you. Bad things are coming in one way or another. You know that. But something else is going to come in your life. Someone's going to get a diagnosis that you say, I wasn't ready. There's going to be a car crash. There, there will probably be another car crash. I'm not prophesying over you. I'm just saying there's probably going to be another call. And there's a car crash. And this is what's happened. Would you come to the hospital? You're going to get another call like that. What are you going to do in that day? You could say after you hang up the phone, consider and answer me, O oh Lord my God as I drive to the hospital. These were left as prayers for us. This is ammunition for us. Prayer ammunition. The first part of this prayer is David's despair. Almost at the point I would say maybe he wouldn't even pray. The second part is David's prayer, his request. The third part here is David's trust. And I love the words that we see in verse 5. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. Now his prayer takes on a different tone altogether, doesn't it? But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. This is really different than the how long, how long, how long. Something goes off in David's mind. Maybe the Spirit reminds him of what God has done for him. And David says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. He knows what's going on in his circumstance, 
But at this part in the prayer, he remembers who God is, regardless of his circumstance. He says, I remember something about you, and I don't see it right now. I, I don't feel your steadfast love. You notice he doesn't say, I feel your steadfast love. I have seen your steadfast love being in answer to my prayer. He says, I have trusted in your steadfast love, and I do not think he's seen the answer to his prayer yet. In my, how long, I have no idea when you're going to answer, how you're going to answer me. I have trusted in your steadfast love. You might have a different word in your Bible. Some translations have the word commitment. I have trusted in your commitment. That, that it, it's tricky. And I'll, I'll say it once and I'll say it again from now, but I am not a Hebrew scholar. But the word behind it is a little tricky word, hesed. Maybe you've heard it if you've ever around in Bible studies. But steadfast love is translating the Hebrew word hesed. And it, it, it's hard to translate because sometimes it means like loyalty or commitment and sometimes it means like unconditional love. How are you going to work that out? If you read eight translations, you might end up with really different things coming out of there. They're trying to wrestle with how do you pull out Total commitment and warm love with one English word. How are you going to do that? So the translators in my Bible, the ESV, they usually come up with steadfast love. They have to use these two. It's God's steadfast love. It's not moving. It's a committed love. It's not an on-again, off-again love. It's, it's a covenant love. What God made with His people of Israel. I make a covenant with you. I will be your God. And you will be my people. And that covenant depends on God's faithfulness. I've said it before, but the difference between a contract and a covenant. A contract, you're saying, what can I, what can I get from you? A covenant is saying, this is what I offer you. And God said, I offer to always be your God. That's my side of the agreement. And I'm asking you to offer to be my people. And so when it's His steadfast love, it's His own commitment to love us. It's not that we did something that He said, that's really cool, I'm going to love them now. He says, I have committed to love you. That's what David trusted in. He says, I trust in your own commitment, in your own character to be a loving God. He says, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Now here's faith. He has not seen the salvation yet. Maybe other answers to prayer in the past. But he says, I will. I don't know how yet, but I will. My heart shall rejoice. Notice the contrast. The verse before, verse 4, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Verse 5, my heart shall rejoice. My enemies want to do this. But I know what my heart will do. I will come out of this valley and I will walk up a mountain somewhere. Not because he's using positive thinking mindfulness. You see, there's, a, there's an errant brand of this in our world that says, if you think things, they'll happen in your life. If you think positive things, you can create it by the power of your mind. That's not Christianity. Christianity is different. He says, I'm not creating something by thinking positive things and saying positive things. I believe in God. My heart shall rejoice in His salvation. Because who He is. Verse 6. We're at the height of His prayer. I will sing to the Lord. In six verses, we've gone on quite a little journey. Verse 1, how long, O Lord? Verse 6, I will sing to the Lord. Because, why? I will sing to the Lord because He has dealt bountifully with me. Dealt bountifully. Some translations like the NIV says, He has been good to me. That's true. But I wonder if it, it comes a little short. 
I wonder if Delt Bamberfly actually grabs the bigger picture. Delt Bamberfly means I asked for something and he gave me more than what I asked for. Or I didn't ask and he gave me something good. That's how it is with all of us. There's many things we didn't ask for and he just gave them anyway. He has dealt bountifully with me. And I, I think again, he has not seen the answer to his prayer yet. He says, God has dealt bountifully with me, and his enemy is still exalted over him. Maybe he's still in the desert, sleeping in a cave. And he says, God has dealt bountifully with me. Those are the words of faith. And it's prayer ammunition for us. That's faith ammunition. Next time in you're in some slope, I doubt that you'll be in the Judean wilderness being chased by an Israeli king. I doubt it. But I think you will face something that feels like it. You'll face something, a sickness, a relationship that suddenly, whoa, goes sideways. And you say, how could we ever be at this much odds between me and so-and-so? But you could say, I will sing to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord in the middle of my troubles, for He has dealt bountifully with me. There's another psalm that says, forget not all His benefits. Memory is a spiritual matter. It's not just a matter of brain, psychology, psychiatry, whatever. Memory is spiritual. If you can remember who God is, remember what God's done, remember how He's dealt bountifully, it's going to affect how you live now. You'll notice that from the beginning to the end, we move from the present to the past and to the future. His eyes are stuck in the present in the beginning, but he remembers what God has done and he knows what God will do. In the beginning, his eyes are stuck on earth. And by the end, his eyes are more up to heaven. In the beginning, I think his eyes are, are more on himself, in his own pain, and by the end, his eyes are more on God. But the whole thing is an act of trust. I love the last two verses. I love them. I love them, I love them, I love them. I love the breaking out, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. I love that. That holds my soul. But it doesn't make the first prayer sinful. It doesn't make the first prayer, this is a C minus prayer, and the last part's an A plus. So let's minimize those, numbers. that's an elementary school prayer. Let's move on to the better prayers. The first prayer is an act of trust. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be there. He took the how longs to God. If there was no trust involved, he wouldn't have even said those things to God. He would have said, not even worth it. God's not going to hear. But he says, because you hear, I'm saying, how long are you going to forget me? Because I know who you are, I'm going to say, where's your face? Where's your favor? The entire psalm, verse 1 to verse 6, is a prayer of trust. To the choir master, to all the people of God, to hear and to pray and to sing again. It's for us. What do you need to trust in God's steadfast love for? I can't answer that for you. If there's things in my life, there's things for my family that I need to say, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. And I wonder what that is for you. I wonder if you know somebody who's struggling, who's not here this morning, who, who needs to hear that verse? Who needs to hear this song? Who needs something, how do I put words to my pain, and, and yet my faith is still going? This would be a great song to pass on to someone like that. Through an email, through a memo on paper, through a text message, or a song to, to lay out on your bedside and then kneel down over and say, God, I'm, I'm praying these words. In sorrow and in faith and in joy. 
I anticipate that there's another category of person in the room here this morning who's maybe not in the dumps. Like there's people here who need this um, like a lifeline. But there might be people in this room here this morning who you don't feel like you're being chased or hounded by anything. But would you file it away in your mind for when the day comes? The next thing that will come. Will you remember the Psalms are loaded? with prayers that I can pray. That I can just open it any time I want. As much as I want. It's a banquet. All you can eat and it's free. <laughs> you get to come to it. Would you put this psalm and the whole book in your back pocket and say, next time something's going wrong, I won't just watch a movie to numb the pain. I won't just get a banana muffin and say, okay, we'll just eat this. <laughs> Would you, would you open the book of Psalms and get on your knees with God? Let's go to Him in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we come before You in the name of Jesus. Lord, I lift up to You everybody in this room who might be in a low place and needs to express themselves and to trust in Your steadfast love. I pray that you would carry their burdens and you would be their God. Father, I pray that you would form us more and more to be a people who always go to you with the good things and the bad things, with the easy things and the hard things, with the blessings and the curses. Father, I pray for all my brothers and sisters and pray that you would help us to walk in faith, whether we feel low or feel well. I pray that you would help us to pray these things and to soak ourselves in your word. We need you, God, and I thank you so much that you left us psalms like this that put words to all kinds of emotions and situations. Give us prayers to pray. I give you thanks. We worship you. I pray that you would help us to continue to sing to you and to enjoy our fellowship today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.